In this video, we will talk about the rhetorical communication tradition, from the fundamental law of rhetoric, principles, paradigms, modes of persuasion, to critical thinkers, and the power of words. That fighting for women's rights has too often become synonymous with man-hating. If there is one thing I know for certain, it is that this has to stop. She does make a compelling case. There really is a persuasive quality in the way she addresses the public. Have you heard about the rhetoric communication tradition? It seems like her speech and delivery really takes off from the same communication tradition. The rhetorical tradition treats communication as a form of an artful public address. It focuses on how the sender persuades their audience with the use of symbols, style of speech, and mode of delivery. The rhetorical tradition of communication is linked to where the discipline of communication initially started, in the 5th century BC in Greece. During that time, the art of persuasion often came in mind when discussing about the rhetorical tradition since communication and information go hand in hand with educated societies and individuals. Plato wrote about rhetoric in the form of dialogues with Socrates as the main character. Through this, the dialectic or a process of question and answers that would lead to the ultimate truth and understanding was born. This was a great contribution to the classical rhetorical theory that, ironically, Plato was very critical of. In Gorgias, he stated that because rhetoric does not require a unique body of knowledge, it is a false rather than true art. Aristotle defined rhetoric as the ability to see what is possibly persuasive in every given case. With that said, based on the rhetorical communication tradition, communication operates by persuading people to believe what is being said. Aristotle gave three pillars or persuasive appeals. Pathos, ethos, logos. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. It has been 56 years since the day that Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous speech, I Have a Dream, in Washington, D.C., and up to this day... This speech is considered one of the most powerful speeches and that is because of his credibility. He was a member of the Executive Committee of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and was president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization that was created to provide the civil rights movement at that time with new leadership. With that said, this clip can be considered an example of a speech that was considered powerful because of its ethos or the appeal based on the credibility of the speaker. There are many factors of credibility such as the speaker's reputation, his or her experience and achievements, the position he or she holds, his knowledge in the subject matter, and the way he or she presents himself to the audience, most of which were good in Martin Luther King Jr.'s case. I wasn't born in this country. I didn't grow up in any one particular religion. I have a mixed race background, and I'm gay. That clip was the conclusion of Wentworth Miller's speech on coming out and the struggles that came with it at the Human Rights Campaign Dinner in Seattle. By telling his story, he was able to persuade people of the importance of making gay people feel that they are not alone and that is an example of pathos or the appeal based on emotion. Other ways of stimulating the emotions of the audience are showing a powerful image or video or explaining the topic by connecting it to the things they already know and experiences they have already went through. So let's get started with anxiety management. 85% of people tell us 
that they're nervous when speaking in public. And I think the other 15% are lying. Hey, we could create a situation where we could make them nervous too. In fact, just this past week, a study from Chapman University asked Americans, what are the things you fear most? And among being caught in a surprise terrorist attack, having identity, your identity stolen, was public speaking. Among the top five was speaking in front of others. This is a part of Matt Abrams' talk called Think Fast, Talk Smart, Communication Techniques. Remember when he mentioned a percentage? A study conducted by Chapman University and the results of that study? That is one way of how logos or the appeal based on logic can be used. An argument or speech is logical if it is supported by reliable data, facts, statistics, tests, and research. It is important to balance pathos, ethos, and logos because too much or too little of even one of these pillars may be the reason why the audience does not believe in the speaker. Logos should always be strong, but the level of strength of pathos and ethos should be based on what the subject matter is and who is listening to it. Cicero also had a great contribution to the rhetoric tradition. He came up with the five canons or steps of speech preparation. The first step is the invention and the creation of valid arguments based on logic. The next step is to arrange those arguments in a way that will meet the purpose of getting the audience to believe the arguments being made. For Aristotle, the logical appeals should be the main arguments while the appeals to ethos and pathos should be part of the introduction and the conclusion of a speech. After arranging his arguments, the writer should consider the style of his or her speech, specifically his or her language choices that will entertain the audience and as a result will up the chance of the argument to be believed by them. The next step is memory. Back in the classical period, it was important to memorize the arguments and the speech. Nowadays, the same cannot be said because the use of notes, cue cards, and teleprompters are often part of a speech and has taken the place of memory. The last step is the delivery, which includes all aspects of the speech. The speaker's gestures while speaking, the amount of eye contact with the audience, the tone of the speaker, his or her pronunciation, and even the confidence he or she shows while speaking. Stephen Tolman represented the modern era by contributing to the rhetoric tradition through his development of the Tolman model as a means of constructing persuasive arguments. For Tolman, there are six important factors to consider when making the argument. There's the claim or the argument itself, the grounds or the facts that the argument is based on, the warrant which connects the grounds to the claim, the backing which supports the warrant, the qualifiers such as possibly or certainly which show the strength of the claim, and the rebuttal which is the exceptions or the counter-arguments of the claim. For Tolman, to be effective, the speaker must find a claim that people will be interested in and find facts that will support and justify that claim. With the help of rhetoric communication tradition and the concepts introduced by its contributors such as Aristotle, Cicero, and Stephen Tolman, people would be able to create a good and strong argument and make a better judgment of the speech or arguments being presented to them. It can be used by people to think before making a judgment. It reminds them to consider the context behind what is being said before deciding how they view or feel about it and how they view and feel about the speaker as well. The rhetorical tradition can be applied nowadays through a speaker asking the audience questions that they are not required to answer, but will leave them thinking of it and the answer even after the speaker is finished talking. Or through advertising, in which we find typical elements of persuasive communication, which deliberately aim to influence knowledge, assessments, 
attitudes, behavior in certain areas of human activity with respect to the promotion or sale of a product or service. Or in politics and campaigning, in which electoral candidates give a platform that they hope would persuade the voters to write their names on the ballot. It can also be applied to a person's everyday life through obtaining speaking to a person about his or her beliefs or stand on a matter and persuade the listener to believe or as well as through sharing a story or experience that will evoke the thoughts and emotions of their listener, which are two main purposes of the tradition. With that said, communication is an essential part of human existence. And because persuasion is one of the natural and most frequent uses of communication, a rhetorical dimension can be found in almost every aspect of it. It is impossible not to communicate, stated as the first axiom of the pragmatics of human communication. There is no need to have full knowledge on the rhetorical theory to use rhetorical figures properly or to make complex argumentative forms. This ability depends on individual talent and culture and is at least partly rooted in the communicative skill of each speaker.